Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Candice, and I'm an event manager at Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of Town Hall, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's live stream presentation with author Fenton Johnson and Diane April. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in today. Um, Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can sustain, share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank F uh, Fenton and Diane for appearing uh, to help make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. A few of our upcoming programs include a deep dive into our local history of hip hop with Dowdy Abe, scuba diving philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith discussing the birth of the mind, and an event with Tamara Payne on the life of Malcolm X co-presented with the Northwest African American Museum. Much more uh, is to come this season, and so check out our calendar on townhallseattle.org to see what's coming. Town Hall has been put under significant strain uh, due to the ever-changing landscape. We hope you'll consider extending your generosity to support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking on the link to donate on your screen or becoming a member. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of COVID and can use your support as well. If you're interested in purch purchasing a copy of the book being presented today, please use the link on the live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page. Uh, the link to that is in the chat here. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video there on YouTube and also here on Crowdcast will be available for re-watching immediately following today's broadcast. Today's presentation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Fenton and Diane will select questions from those submitted in the, in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of, of your screen throughout the program, so please submit those at any time. We will also take questions from the YouTube chat. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and through the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and Wincoat Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I want to thank all of the members watching today as well. Fendon Johnson lives in San Francisco and Tucson, but is often found hiking in his native Kentucky. An award-winning author of fiction and nonfiction, he teaches at the University of Arizona and Spalding University, contributes to Harper's Magazine, and has been featured on Fresh Air. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. His memoir, Geography of the Heart, released in 1996, received an American Library Association and Lambda Literary Awards for Best LGBT Creative Nonfiction and his book, Keeping Faith, from 2003, received a Lambda Literary and Kentucky Literary Award in creative nonfiction. Dan April is an award-winning journalist and author of The Abbey of Gethsemane, Place of Peace and Paradox. She teaches creative nonfiction on the faculty of Spalding University Master of Fine Arts in Writing program. Johnson's book, At the Center of All Beauty, Solitude, and Creative Life, is the subject of today's talk. So please join me in welcoming Fenton Johnson and Diane April. Hola, Fenton. I've been looking forward to discussing this beautiful and comforting and provocative new book of yours for a long, long time. Um, in fact, we had planned to be able to do this live face-to-face -face, uh, on the stage at Town Hall in Seattle back in March. And then a little problem arose, something called a global pandemic. And <laughs> we, we had to delay it a bit. And so now 10 months later, here we are. Um, but in some ways, I think it's, it's a, a positive that we've had all this time uh, since your book was published to really luxuriate in the stories, the characters, uh, the insights and the observations you make in this book. Um, I want to say um, 
first of all, that I think it's really interesting that this is a book about solitude and solitaries, and, and yet it is so full of um, interrelationships and um, conversations and interactions uh, between and among people. And I think that's one of the interesting things that you get into in the book. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, give um, two lines um, that have been written about your book. One is from the uh, really wonderful New York Times review by Catherine Hughes, in which she said, um, in this lyrical yet finely argued book, Johnson sets out to show that being alone, so different from loneliness, its direct opposite, in fact, is absolutely essential to the creative life. And then from um, an interview you did um, with uh, Chris Latre at the Rumpus, I wanted to um, quote this because I think um, it's really important to what you're getting at in the book too. The result of this book is a wise, beautiful meditation on what it means to seek a solitary existence in a world that almost demands we pair up in state-sanctioned marriages. So then uh, before we turn this over to you, I just wanted to say that um, we have known each other now for about a quarter of a century, give or take, um, and we share some really important common elements. One of them is um, we both have Kentucky hometowns. Mine is Louisville from the largest uh, city in Kentucky, and yours is a very small town, just a stone's throw from the Abbey of Gethsemane, which is another one of our mutual interests and affinities is uh, monastic life, understanding that, uh, the solitary life. And uh, it was in fact at the Abbey of Gethsemane in I think 1996 that we cemented our friendship as observers at um, a conference that was held called the Gethsemane Encounter, which grew out of the relationship that two solitaries had, the Dalai Lama and Thomas Merton, when they met in 1968, shortly before Merton died, when he was in Asia. Um, and at that conference, you and I had time, because it was a long weekend, as I recall, we had time to talk and, and um, realize we had so much in common. And then finally, of course, um, we both teach and have taught for some time at um, Spalding University's MFA in writing program. We both teach creative nonfiction. So um, with that, I, I think it's important because friendship is an element of this that you discuss quite a bit in the book. And uh, so perhaps you can now just uh, read a little from the book and, and uh, give us uh, an intro to it. Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks, Diane, very much for um, that beautiful introduction, especially for um, reminding us or and letting our audience know about the length and depth of our friendship, the role of friendship as a theme in the book, and also that connection through um, the Abbey of Gethsemane. I know that there are other people People have tuned in who have visited the Abbey and know the Abbey pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to be able to uh, bring it to life in the course of our um, of our afternoon here. Um, thanks to Candace and the town hall staff who has been who have been just enormously patient in trying to make this happen and making it happen not only for me but for other authors and presenters across the uh, uh, autumn and let's hope not too far in the mm -hmm. new year. I was really, really, really looking forward to being in that beautiful space downtown. I've been to Seattle a number of times, but I've never been in that space. And um, so thank you to the, to the staff, um, to Elliott Bay, where I've read a couple of times and which is really a fantastic bookstore. And I've hope that all of our audience uh, will buy their books, no matter how much of a hurry you're in from your local independent bookstore, wherever that may happen to be, and particularly from um, Elliott Bay, if you're in the Seattle area, I don't know for sure, but I'd be willing to guarantee that Elliott Bay, like many independent bookstores, will get a book to you, even if you are not in the Seattle area, and so I encourage you to um, use them. Um, 
Before we move on, I'd like to say, because of, in honor of our common roots, I like to do two things. I like to call out somebody who's been really, really important to me in the last year, and um, so I'll do that first. Um, actually, I'd like to thank, there were a lot of people from the coast, the Pacific coast, but a number from Washington, from Seattle, that I met in doing political work in Arizona in the last um, couple of months. And I really want to thank those people for being so um, dedicated and committed that they would come down to admittedly beautiful Southern Arizona, sunny Southern Arizona, and do that work. I also want to thank the people in um, Louisville um, for keeping the memory of Breonna Taylor alive and not letting that slip away in the face of so many forces that want to make it slip away. I think that's really, really, really brave, and I want to say thank you to them. Finally, the last thing I do at every reading is to invite everybody to take a moment of silence and put your feet on the floor. The Native people say our strength comes from the earth. Uh, and it's amazing how such a simple little gesture, just putting both of your feet flat on the floor can make you feel more, I don't know, stable and centered and don't after the last week, we can only use a little bit of stability and centering. So put your feet on the floor and think about somebody who's been important to you in your life. Um, and just think about them for a second before we start into the reading. All right, so um, uh, I'd like to start this reading by, um, I didn't cite the full uh, Frank O'Hara poem that is the epigraph to the book um, because it was really expensive <laughs> to quote those lines. Frank O'Hara, gay poet who died mysterious, under mysterious circumstances at 40 years old in 1964 on the beach at um, Far Island, run over by a Jeep at three o'clock in the morning. Um, the, uh, so I, I memorized it, um, a practice I recommend for anybody who is looking for a way to a long, boring drive, stick a poem to the dashboard, memorize it on the way, uh, put a poem above the toilet in your bathroom, you know, wherever. So here's the whole poem. Um, there's only an excerpt of it in the book, and in the poem is the title of the book. It's called Autobiographia. <clears throat> Autobiographia Literaria, or Literary Autobiography. When I was a child, I played by myself in a corner of the school. When I was a child, I played in the corner of the schoolyard all alone. I hated dolls and I hated games. Animals were not friendly and birds flew away. If anyone came looking for me, I hid behind a tree and cried out, I am an orphan. Now, here I am, the center of all beauty, writing these poems. Imagine. And I love that little poem uh, because of a lot of reasons. Um, you know, that last line is a command. Uh, it's an imperative. Uh, imagine, with an exclamation. Um, and of course, one thing he wants you to imagine is the magnitude of the journey that he made from that childhood to the place where he is the center of all beauty writing these poems. But it's also a command to us to imagine our world, what in our world, where can we go in our world to a fuller, richer, better place? Uh, it's about the power of imagination. So with that little introduction, I'm gonna read a little bit that um, if for those who haven't read the book yet, that um, pretty much says what the book is. And then after I do that, in about 10 minutes, I will turn it over to Diane, because uh, the fun part of this is really going to be um, our back and forth. So this is from uh, At the Center of All Beauty, Solitude and the Creative Life. We are in the midst of a demographic revolution whose long-term implications may be as significant as the 20th century's mass migration from the countryside to the city. I speak of the astonishing numbers of people worldwide who are choosing to live alone or who deliberately carve out periods of solitude from otherwise conventionally coupled lives. The evidence is accumulating that when people, especially women, are presented with the opportunity and the means to live alone, many will sacrifice to seize it. That the number of solitaries is growing worldwide is without question, but we have made little acknowledgement and accommodation of that fact. 
our housing, healthcare, ur and urban planning. Everything from restaurant design to discount gym memberships to the gargantuan loaves of bread our bakeries turn out is still based on the ideal coupled household, preferably, preferably with two children. Of greatest consequence, the stories we tell ourselves embody fantasies of idealized couples and families, even if in, in, uncon even if in unconventional configurations, instead of the rich and rewarding solitary journeys more and more of us are living out. And one of the things that's been interesting uh, because the book's been out for six months is that I get letters and emails from people, I could read something, and they're kind of embarrassing. I think they, they really, well, that they're just so astonished at seeing something on the bookshelf that has something relevant to their lives instead of uh, stories that we're all telling ourselves these days and still continue and continue to tell ourselves. Some see in this de development a sign of social breakdown. I look at this demographic transformation and <clears throat> see not the crumbling cornerstone of society, but the potential for more diverse and loving relationships to one another and to the planet. With 7.5 billion plus people on earth, surely solitaries, especially those who are childless or who adopt, offer alternative stories worth our attention and support. In my case, early in my 20s, I realized that with many nieces and nephews already born and more likely to arrive, the planet had no shortage of my particular genetic material. In a world groaning under the weight of too many people, I would undertake the second most selfless imagine the second most selfless act I could imagine. I would remain childless. I would do my best to serve others as a teacher and a writer. Perhaps some deep wisdom is manifesting itself in these millions of people seeking or at least experiencing solitude. Perhaps solitaries are evidence of an aspect of the human character only now permitted to blossom. If one subscribes to the Western conception of progress, that it is possible to study our past, learn from it, and apply those lessons to build a better future, maybe studying the works and lives of our solitaries is key to reconceiving our understanding of the human family. And now uh, uh, about a definition of terms, it's always good to define the terms. Yes. What then defines a solitary? Solitaries have no piece of paper in the city hall, to quote Joni Mitchell, for self standard to solitude. We have no church or government certification or sanction of our status. We certify it in our hearts and for ourselves, we live it out. We are different from the rest, something odd about us, apt to go off and meditate and muse in solitude. I write for you, my fellow traveler, my intimate for the next few minutes or hours, for you, my solitary friend, I recognize you when we encounter each other, alone on the hiking trail, alone in a museum, alone in a church, alone in your choice of the solitude of reading over the cacophony of voices and images available through online chat and distraction, alone in your room. But now we come to a koan in Zen Buddhism, a question or quandary to be contemplated in silence, in solitude and in silence. What figure does the solitary cut in the human tapestry? What is the usefulness of sitting alone writing or painting or reading or watching the changing light? What is the use usefulness of the flaneur, the solitary walker in the city streets or the autumn forest? What is the usefulness of the solitary, most especially the childless solitary, whose very existence points to the biggest question, absent reproduction, which after all, bacteria accomplish more efficiently than human beings, what is the usefulness of life? You see, I like to take on the small questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to write it. Can, as some philosopher said, if it's worth saying it can be written about with clarity, that's my, that's, that's my goal. That's mm -hmm. what I try to do. Here is a great secret, seldom acknowledged in popular culture. It is possible to be a solitary within a couple. Within a couple. In fact, the most successful couples of my acquaintance are composed of solitaries leading parallel lives who understand both the rewards and responsibilities of being together and the rewards and responsibilities of being apart. And then I will turn to um, 
You know, one of the pleasures of this book and, and of uh, writing creative nonfiction, Diane knows this, is the way one gets to be a conduit for words that other people say, and you get to bring them to an audience who might not otherwise encounter them. But I'm skipping over all those to um, the very end. In my brave new world, we celebrate friendship as the queen of virtues, recognized as the foundation for all worthy human connection, including most particularly marriage. We create storylines other than that of the familiar fortress household, wherein each carefully plotted and spaced house reproduces the nation state in miniature, us inside versus them outside. We open ourselves to love in all of its manifestations. We eliminate hierarchies of love. The parent's love of a child, the dog's love of its master, the walker's love of the path, the reader's love of the word and print, the child's love of everything, the son's love of his mother, the daughter's love of her father, the love of friends, and above all, the love of self, the heresy of self-love. I seat them all at the great round table of the feast of love, a table that grows larger as more people come to sit, a meal that never exhausts itself, a table where there is room, yes, there is, for those who are married. If my dream strikes you as utopian, deluded, grandiose, I point to the great failure of politicians to provide a vision sufficiently grand to, to counter the call to unrestrained consumption trotted out before us at every hour of every day in every popular medium. My vision is no more fantastic than colonies on Mars, solar grids in space, heat transfer from the oceans, impregnable vaults for nuclear waste, carbon dioxide storage under the Great Plains, or any number, any of hundreds of proposals our politicians and research institutions and media take seriously. It requires no trillion dollar investment in technology, which history teaches us will inevitably generate problems equal or greater than those it solves. Thomas Merton, the great spiritual writer and Trappist monk that Diane made a reference to earlier, Thomas Merton writes of solitaries that we are, quote, a mute witness, a secret and invisible expression of love, which takes the form of our own option for solitude in preference to the exception, acceptance of social fictions. And what love are we solitaries mute to? Uh, and, and this is my question. And what love are we solitaries mute witnesses to? The omnipresence of the great alone, the infinite possibilities of no duality, no separation between you and me, between the speaker and the spoken to, the dancer and his dance, the writer and her reader, people and our earth. So thank you. That's a that's a kind of smorgasbord of selections, I guess, from the book. And, um, and with a lot of pleasure and just delight and jumped up and down in my seat because I worked a lot in the elections in the last week. <laughs> Yes. Arizona voted to tax the rich to finance education. Is that conceivable? <laughs> so I'm I'm really excited. Diane? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> okay, well, I think I'm gonna riff off your table metaphor for a moment and say this is an appetizer question. Um so <clears throat> I'd like you to talk about the appropriateness. Um and the pros and the cons of publishing this book at this time um, during the COVID quarantine era when people who aren't usually solitaries have been put in that position. So what about the timing of this book do you have to say? Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, I got a question from a friend uh, that I've been pondering a lot ever since then. Um, uh, a friend wrote me and said, uh, do you think Americans will learn to be alone? I thought, well, that's an, after reading the book. And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. What do I think about that? Um, let me say a word about the evolution of this book first uh, and the structure of the book, because I began this book in 2003. So, um, uh, you know, it just evolved over the years. I, 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 I think every writer does this. I certainly do. I just kind of look at what it is that I'm reading. I'm looking for ideas. Uh, ideas present themselves to me. I look at what I'm reading and what I'm looking at and whatever. And um, I noticed that I was reading all these books by people who were some, what I would call solitaries. 
And that whenever I went into a museum or listened to a piece of music, I really loved Eric Satie, for example, classic solitary. I really loved um, Cezanne, of course, who crops up, um, other, many other artists that I, and I thought, well, you know, there's nothing on the bookshelves for people who live alone. Let's write a book for people who live alone. Mm -hmm. And then two other books intervened. Um, but, um, you know, I was living in France at the time that I, actually I went to France um, to do some research and um, the research gradually accumulated and um, and then I decided to sort of put it all together and throw a thread into it of my own experience, which is what I like to do. I think I can safely say what we like to do is to integrate the first person voice into our uh, research. Um, and um, so uh, that was the, um, the evolution of the book. And then um, did I feel, I, I, I felt as I got older, um, strongly the way in which, more and more strongly in the way in which there was nothing out there for people who were living alone or who enjoyed, even people who enjoyed solitude or the couples that I admired where you know, where the, and, and, and my parents presented themselves to me in the course of the writing of this book. This was a surprise to me. Um, I hadn't anticipated that, as, but I came to recognize that they were in their very particular ways solitaries um, and that they were a great example to balance the better known people that I was profiling and writing about. Here were people who were extraordinary people actually but they you know lived in a small town in rural kentucky they were not you know mm -hmm. painters who had paintings on the walls of the metropolitan museum and so it made for a nice mix of all that then COVID happened and um i'd like to think that we are all as my friend in, in my friend's question, learning to appreciate the virtues of solitude and how to how to work with it. I will say that I have to say because it's true of me. Um, this is an extraordinary situation, of course, because it's not like we were choosing solitude. We're having solitude enforced upon us, yeah. and in and, and by a very unhappy um, circumstance that has not only killed a lot of people and made a lot of people sick, but that also has created political divisions in a country that doesn't seem to be able to deal with a public health issue without making it a political issue. Um, but I think that it is, I'd like to think that the book is a tool in some way and the letters that I've gotten make me feel that way, that it works that way. Mm -hmm. It's a tool for people who want to try to keep their eyes on the prize in the sense of mm -hmm. figuring out a way to use the solitude, um, to embrace the solitude. Um, you know, at one point when I was becoming a writer and I was trying to figure out, because I wasn't mm, by nature, I'm a kind of party boy. And, um, and I typed something and I put it above my desk saying, embrace your solitude. <laughs> and that was good advice. Good advice, uh, yes. Yeah, and I'll finish with this by saying I know there's a, a, a citation that you really like in the book, which is from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, yeah. who was, you know, mother of seven, involved in um, every, you know, feminine uh, suffrage movement, a national political figure, um, and she wrote this fabulous book called. Um, uh, the Solitude of Self. Uh, I was walking down a bookstore, a used bookstore in Brooklyn, and this book literally fell out on the floor in front of me. And I really recommend it. And she has one of the most eloquent statements imaginable about the nature of solitude. And here's a woman with seven kids and married, married and whatever, right. you know. So I'd like to think that the book is a tool to help people, you know, embrace their solitude. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could easily find that quote in the book and read it? Uh, yeah, yeah I, it was in the back of the book. And then I decided, you know, I don't like this too much. I really want it to be at the front of the book. Yeah, <laughs> so I, really I love one of it. The last things that I did was mm -hmm. uh, to move this to the front. Um, she, she said this before a committee before the U in the yeah. U.S. Senate, a committee on mm -hmm. suffrage. Boy, has the U.S. Senate fallen a long way since then. 
Here's the quotation, 1898. Think for, and, and this is part of her argument for giving women the right to vote, because she said, she's saying, we're all alone in the world and we need an equal playing field. Every person is finally alone. And so it's unjust to, to, um, to de deny people uh, the, this specific part, uh, participation as embodied in the right to vote. Here's the quotation. Uh, think for a moment of the immeasurable solitude of self. We come into the world alone, unlike all who have gone before us. We leave it alone under circumstances peculiar to ourselves. When death sunders our nearest ties, alone we sit in the shadow of our affliction. Alike amid the greatest triumphs and the darkest tragedies of life, we walk alone. On the divine heights of human attainment, eulogized and worshipped as a hero or a saint, we stand alone. In ignorance, poverty, and vice, as a pauper or criminal, alone we starve or steal. Alone we suffer the sneers and rebuffs of our fellows. Alone we are hunted and hounded through dark courts and alleys, and byways and highways. Alone we stand in the judgment seat. Alone in the prison cell we lament our crimes and misfortunes. Alone we expiate them on the gallows. In hours like this, we realize the awful solitude of individual life, its past, its penalties, its responsibilities. There is a solitude which each and every one of us has always carried with him, more inaccessible than the ice cold mountains, more profound than the midnight sea, the solitude of self. To it, only omniscience is permitted to enter. Such is the individual life. It's beautiful. I think it yeah, says. It says it all. Um, you know, you mentioned having that phrase taped up in your office to look at. It made me think of the poster that you talk about at the beginning of the book. And I wonder if you might just talk a little bit about that. I, I know it's on your wall somewhere in your Yeah, it is. Um, a graduate student, well, uh, uh, well uh, so when I was in the seventh grade and, you know, deeply Catholic, uh, very German Catholic conservative rural corner of Kentucky, which for reasons of accidents of, of history um, uh, is uh, almost 100% Catholic, certainly was in those days. Um, and um, we were given the assignment to um, draw a principle from the religion <laughs> textbook, which was the Baltimore Catechism. So I drew um, three roads to life. I meant to bring it with me, but I forgot. Uh. Um, uh, and one of the roads, they, they, go, they fork. There's a path, there are feet on a path, footsteps, and there are three roads, and they go to three clouds. And one of the clouds is the, the religious life, and it has a priest's hat and a uh, uh, a cross, um, and then the middle cloud is the married life, and it has a baby bassinet labeled junior, <laughs> and a contract, a legal contract. I, now, how I was so prescient at the seventh grade is pretty amazing to me. Yeah. Um, and then there's a single life. There's a cloud for the single life, and I, I couldn't imagine a metaphor for the single life, and so finally I drew Dance, a series of dancing musical notes and wrote party time underneath them. <laughs> and I put yellow tulips on either side. You can still see this in the poster. Um, Long the road to heaven. And my aged nun, the infamous Sister Marie Therese, came along with a rubber tip pointer. And she made me erase all the yellow tulips. You can still see the smudge marks because she said, there are no yellow tulips on the road to heaven. <laughs> She so, knew, right? <laughs> yeah, and she had, you know, an intelligent woman who grew up in the rural South. She had some knowledge about there being no <laughs> yellow tulips on the road, on the road to heaven. Right. And who saved that poster? Was that your well, mom? I, you know, uh, a graduate student who was himself a very um, superb painter and artist, a creative writing graduate student, came into my house and he said wow who did that great piece of folk art and i <laughs> said well, i did that first yeah. and he said he was working at a framing shop and he said you you got to frame that 
I'll frame it for you as a thank you gift for, yeah. and he did. And, and so now it hangs mm -hmm. on the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And it's a wonderful introduction to your book. Um, okay, so you've talked a little bit about how the idea came up and how long it took to get it together. Um, and you talked a little bit about how you wanted to look at famous people who had lived solitary lives, the extraordinary people. But you also wanted to look at your parents who were extraordinary, but also ordinary. Um, did you, um, you said you didn't think that that was going to be a part of the book, but did you discover things about their relationship and your relationship to them as you wrote? Was this kind of uh, a path for you to take into a better understanding of your parents as you wrote? Um, well, uh, uh, yes, um, I, I was searching from the beginning about from, uh, you know, the, the, the book, the, the, the structure of the book is that there are um, re heavily researched chapters, although like I think a lot of writers, I do way, way, way more research than actually ends up at the book. I give the, I like to give the reader the, you know, the sort of... Um, uh, cream of uh, what it is that I've done um, mm -hmm. into the lives of people whom I, I, you know, I'll be pretty emphatic about this, uh, presented themselves to me in a way. And the answer is sort of they chose me, you know, yeah. that, that I would, like just found myself reading a lot of Henry James. Or mm -hmm. when I was in France in 2007, I, you know, ended up. Um, being left alone in Cezanne's studio in the middle of a snowstorm in Provence. And, uh, you know, that was just like such a fantastic experience to be in there where, you know, some of the greatest paintings of, of um, uh, Western civilization were, uh, were painted. Um, you know, those sorts of experiences uh, happened. And, uh, you know, Rod McEwen, whom I will draw attention to because um, uh, because he so the pairing of Rod McEwen and Nina Simone was so, well, you know, surprising. But, yeah. you know, I was always interested in Nina Simone. I love mm -hmm. Nina Simone. Um, if anybody out there doesn't know Nina Simone, get um, the Jazz Masters CD of um, Nina Simone, which is like the best of Nina Simone and um, fantastic. And I learned that also she, there are, there are two wonderful documentaries about her too. Yes, well, one of them, yeah. and and one of them I quote from. In fact, in the book, it's called mm -hmm. "What ha Whatever Happened." Mm -hmm. Yeah, a woman who I think um, I offer this theory in the book, but I, I think suffered. You know, she was diagnosed as being bipolar, but I think a lot of her suffering. I know a lot of her suffering came because. She would go up in front of these audiences, mostly white people, and she would absolutely you can watch her performances on YouTube. Mm -hmm. She would just pour her heart out about the injustice that she had seen and experienced, and everybody would wildly applaud it. And then they would just go home and to their jobs, and nothing yeah. would change. And it was so frustrating. You know, she she sang at um, at Selma at the at, at the. Uh, at the um, you know the gathering that was in Selma before at the end of the march uh, or rather in Montgomery, um, so um, and I she has an album called The Single Woman. So I listened to the yeah. title. It was a, her last CD, and I, I always am the writer. You know, I always say like, who wrote the song? <laughs> and it turned out to be Rod McEwen, and I thought Rod uh, McEwen. You know, the, the, the poet everybody loved to hate in the 60s. And Rod McEwen turns out to be this extraordinary character who was really savage. I mean, you know, the poetry is very uneven. I went back and read a lot. But he was not as bad as he was made out to be. And the reason he was made out to be so bad was because he was an openly gay man in the 1960s, and that just was not possible. He was the first artist to demand, require that his concert in um, South Africa be integrated. And he was so powerful as an artist at that point that they complied. 
Um, so it was just, it's just, you know, kind of a really fun investigatory um, mm-hmm. undertaking. Um, so those people kind of chose me in a way. Um, I think I've wandered away from your question. No, no, it's very interesting. I think, um, and I think for both of us, we tell our students that there is often a place where you think you're going, but you encounter another character or another event that takes you in a totally new place. And when those linkages happen, it, it seems like magic, but I think it's just a part of our curiosity and our sense of wanting to know more that leads us to the next step. And uh, that is a, that's a really wonderful pairing, I think, in the book that stands out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and you so, were talking about, I mean, my, the parents, my, you know, one of my yes, siblings, yes. they got it immediately with my father, you know, going off in the woods and building this cabin mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere and whatever. But my mother was such a, you know, party woman. And I responded, um, you know, um, our mother lived what was, you know, from the outside, a kind of conventional life. She lived 101 years. Um, she had a marriage of 42 years, and then her first, 43 maybe, her, her husband, my father, died. And then she married once more for two years, and then that second husband died. But, and this is something, you know, sort of relevant to Elizabeth, the Elizabeth um, Katie Stanton quotation. She lived 101 years, and if you count from her adulthood, she lived almost half of her life alone. She, like so many women, you know, she lived the last 25 years, 20 to 25 years of her life alone. And, you know, I asked her once if she, you know, if the right guy came along, like, mother, would you get married again? Absolutely not. (laughs) So, you know, she she really enjoyed being alone. Yes. Well, you know, uh, the book I've been working on for quite a while about my aunt in Louisville, same thing. She lived, she lived with her mother and brother who didn't marry and she never married until both of them died. And then she lived another 20 years, 25 years, maybe um, alone and uh, was very happy that way. You know, a lot of us thought she, she wouldn't be, she couldn't take care of herself without having people around her. She did just fine. And in, and going back to your idea of friendship, which I do want you to talk a little bit about, um, she she had many, many friends, but she spent the majority of her time alone. And uh, those friends were support and comfort, and she was uh, very important to them. But she, I think, really valued that time that she had day by day alone doing what she wanted to do. Yeah. So. So talk a little bit about the friendships amongst and between solitaries. Well, uh, you know, as a solitary, um, um, I'm not a hermit, you know, uh, and I love giving a dinner party. It's been hard. The COVID thing is hard, you know, because uh, I structure my life to have interactions with um, other people um, uh, in order to balance the solitude of writing and the time I spend alone. And it's easy to go get a little crazy when you um, spend all your time alone. Um, and so you, one has to be careful about that. One has to watch out for that. Um, for me, I have the great gift that my parents gave me, which is um, you put me under a tree and I'm happy. You know, I, I really, the, the, the natural world has so much to teach us about um, being alone. I use trees as a metaphor a lot. I say that, you know, we sing the praises of the forest, you know, the sort of collective grouping of trees. But in fact, the in many, much of our poetry and in Asian art, the admiration is reserved for the solitary pine that is clinging to the cliff above the ocean, you know, uh, for having mm-hmm. toughed it out up there, um, you know, on the cliff. Um, but the balance between um, between solitude and friendship is the place to strike. And and I think just as it's possible for a solitary to get stuck in your own, you know, manure, um, it's also very, very easy, and there's enormous pressure to do so, for 
married people to get stuck in a place where um, they don't bring the outside world into the, their lives and they don't, they don't have lives outside the fortress household, the individual house. I mean, you know, you drive through sort of any classic American suburb and now I cannot, after writing this book, I can't, I look at all those houses and I say, does anybody in there ever talk to anybody, you know, outside the house? So, you know, it's a matter of finding one's way to a middle path, a balance between um, solitude and a community activity with the with each of those uh, reinforcing um, the other and um, providing a foundation for the other. That's what I think. Yes. And yes. friendship, you, you know, you think about, um, you turn on the radio or you turn on the television, every series um, these days is pretty much about, I mean, what you encounter most often Lee, is, you know, chasing romantic love, losing romantic love. It's not for nothing that they always stop at marriage. They don't show what's on the other side. And you think about, you know, I grew up with the music of the 60s. You think about the extraordinary diversity of topics, you know, politics, silliness, um, romantic love, but also, you know, nature. I mean, everything was in those songs. Why can't we go back to a place of that kind of diversity instead of just staying focused on this one single ideal? And I have a whole political riff about that, but mm, I don't know if we have any questions. We could maybe yeah, I was it. just uh, gonna say that we do have a question here. That's an interesting one uh, from Holly. This is, what are your... <laughs> What are your thoughts on only children and choice of solitude? Is this the same as how you define solitary? Well, the word choice is a really interesting word because uh, as I say somewhere in the book, uh, you, you know, how much of our lives do we choose and how much chooses us? Um, I had a you know, profound relationship um, that, among other things, this is uh, described in um, Geography of the Heart, the, the memoir. Um, uh, one of the great revelations that came out of that book was uh, at some point I offered the observation, um, love does not measure itself by the calendar and the clock. Does a mother love her child less because he or she is young? And, um, you know, my editor at the time said, uh, you know, you and your partner were only together a little over three years, and I was sort of skeptical about that. And then I read that sentence, and I realized, you know, love really does not measure itself by calendar and clock. Mm -hmm. So um, he died of AIDS in 1990, only son of Holocaust. He was an only child, only son of Holocaust survivors. Um, and I thought that I would, you know, if you'd asked me at the time, I would have said, oh, you know, in another three or four years, you know, I'll settle down with somebody else or whatever. And then the years passed and that never happened. It just, you know, I can point to reasons why it happened, but we're all, all of our lives are the subject of, 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 of great forces. Um, you, you know, I'm the ninth of nine children. So um, in a way, ask me about the life of an only child. <laughs> it's a very mysterious experience. Um, and yet at the same time, being down at the tail end, um, I was left alone a lot. And, um, you know, I, the older brothers were and sisters were getting about their lives. And so, you know, those, those circumstances happen. From the outside, from the outside, um, I would have to say that so long as the parents don't really put the burden on that child, the only child, that being only child is actually kind of a lucky place to be. Yes. <laughs> um, I hope my son feels that way. Huh? I hope my <laughs> son feels that way. Well, maybe I should turn the question to you and say, as a parent of an only child, what is your perception of it? Well, I do, uh, I, I have my own background, which was being one of three, being the middle child between two brothers. And each of them was, uh, there was a big span of time between our births. So my older brother is six years older than I am and my younger brother is 11 years younger. So 
in some sense, I felt like I was an only child, even though I had siblings at either end because we were so far apart in terms of what we were interested in and all at the time. And I'm, I'm sure that my brother who was six years uh, on his own before I was born, he I'm sure he feels like he had an only child uh, existence for a while. And then my younger brother who was there long after we left, both my older brother and I had sort of an only child experience. So I think it's so relative. Uh, my own feeling about it with my son is that um, it was, it's also the time in which you were an only child because the era, by the time Josh, my son was born, there was daycare and uh, from the time he was an infant, he was with other children, even though he didn't have them at home, they became his friends and he followed path with them all the way through high school. Um, and so there was a different kind of only child experience. Also it was in the era when everybody was doing after school activities and involved in clubs and all that kind of thing. So he never um, experienced what I think uh, only children in my childhood would have had experienced. So I think it's, it's very relative. Mm -hmm. And I think he, I do think that he has a very solitary streak in him, but so do I. Um, so I don't know if that's, you know, it's much well, genetic. Maybe, well, maybe we should talk about, I mean, uh, uh, Holly's question leads us to the question, that question of, you know, what do we choose? What chooses us? Mm -hmm. um, Harper's had assigned me to, I, I was writing a novel in which there was a character who's a Buddhist and I, and, and a, a, a dear friend of us both, Brother Paul Quinon, came hiking over the hills um, to my mother's 80th birthday party, a Trappist monk. And um, he said, the Dalai Lama is coming, you know, this summer to the Abbey of Gethsemane. That's something you might want to write about. And I thought, well, you know, um, I will learn Buddhism in three weeks and then I'll write a piece for Harper's. That was pretty arrogant. And, stupid of me, but that was, um, you know, good to be humbled out of that by the following experience. And then I went to the encounter and I realized that my anger at the, um, the, the conservative Roman Catholic church in which I had been raised was so great that I had to deal with it. And so I wrote a book. Um, that's the book uh, Candace referenced called Keeping Faith a, a, a skeptic's journey among uh, Christian and Buddhist monks um, and uh, living with uh, communities of uh, Trappists and Buddhists. But in a, I mean, that's why there was an interaction there between something that chose me. I mean, if Brother Paul had not hiked across the hill on that particular day, if um, also if I hadn't lived in the West and already gotten a pretty uh, substantial dose of um, Zen Buddhism just by virtue of living in San Francisco, reading mm -hmm. Walt Whitman, Buddhism permeates American letters, um, and Emily Dickinson for that matter. Um, so, you know, there's this complex weave of um, forces that uh, influence us and that we are, and that we in turn influence. Um, right. and, and, and Diane wrote a, a really marvelous book, the best book, about um, the history of Gethsemane, um, uh, which uh, and, and I, don't, I don't really know how you ended up, this being the Trappist Abbey that is located about an hour um, south of Louisville and that remains to this day probably the largest of the shrinking populations and certainly the most influential. Um, monastic uh, uh, Western place of Western monasticism in um, uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere. So I don't know what what's your connection to Gethsemane. I mean, and did that come Very out of strange. solitude? Come out of what? Solitude and interest in solitude, or did that just follow on? I think that um, a lot of things converged, but one of them was that my Jewish husband had a copy of a Merton biography um, in his bookshelf when uh, we first got married. And I looked at that book for years, even having grown up Catholic in Catholic schools, I hadn't really read that much Merton. 
And so I read that book and it just seemed to speak to some of the things I was looking for in my life. And it was a very busy time. I was working full time. I had a young child. And um, so I was working at the newspaper um, as a daily journalist and wormed my way into getting an assignment to go out there. And it was, I think this it was, was be- for the, for the Gethsemane encounter. No, this was way before that, um, oh. like in 90 or so, um, to write a story uh, about their efforts to um, sell cheese and fruitcakes at Christmas. That's That was the story. But when I went out there, I stayed several nights and I'm, I was just overcome by the peace that I felt there. And also the like you were saying, the kind of the solitude of self that I was getting. So then I started going there for retreats a lot, uh, just for myself. And then eventually that book came into being. But it was a, it was a process, and I think it the book was part of it. Reading his biography rather than his autobiography, which I'm not that crazy about, but the biography I really liked, and just feeling like there was something that was calling to me that had been missing that I didn't know that I needed. And then after that, uh, it became just a very special place to me um, and to you. Uh, we well, have some questions here. Do, would you like to ask another question? Um, so how do you, no, wait, it, this is uh, Candace, actually. It seems one of the problems we are having socially and culturally is that we are too outward focused as far as who is doing what wrong. Do you think the solitude can solve this for us or reset us to move out of our current divisive culture? It's a great question. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, you know, it's a great question and also provides, well, two things, an opportunity to say thank you again to Candace for, um, and the staff at um, Seattle Town Hall. Please support them uh, for their work and for making this happen. But also, before we leave the monastery behind entirely, um, to give a book plug, since we mentioned uh, Brother Paul Quinon, and I had made reference to the, the question of, you know, what use is life? He has a wonderful little book called uh, In Praise of the Useless Life. And one of the things that, you know, I wanted the question to that I ask in my book to beg was, um, so what's with this utilitarian thing, you know, which is very Western, very Victorian, you know, that everything has to be useful. It can't just be. And um, so that's just a, you know, I like to leave people with questions. That's the question I will leave you with. Mm -hmm. Um, Regarding Candace's question, you know, gives me an opportunity (laughs) to get a little rip. We think, you know, we believe our politicians, we believe the conversation because of what's given to us. But in fact, the way that we practice the institution of marriage today is pretty recent. And, you know, Shakespeare's era, the 17th century, um, 16th, 17th century would not have recognized um, uh, the way we practice marriage today. Um, Of the 40 pilgrims who are going to Canterbury in uh, Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, exactly one is married, and that is the famously promiscuous wife of Bath. Um, uh, You know, so we think of marriage as being like this thing that has been like created 3,000 or 10,000 or whatever years ago, and in fact, it's an evolving creature that really took its modern form with the rise of the um, Industrial Revolution and the mass relocation of people from the country to the cities, Um, the increasing expensiveness of life that required people to live together in quarters just to to, to be able to pay the bills, childcare being pushed off on women who kept the kids at home. I I mean, all of that, Virginia Woolf satirizes and writes about a lot in, in her writing. And so what I think today that the, this interest in solitude, and it's everywhere, it's, you know, even countries like China and Brazil um, are seeing, especially among women, given the economic opportunity to live alone, they jump on it. And that says something about patriarchal practices and the way of escaping them, of uh, getting out from under the thumb. Um, but it also, I think gives us a way to look at 
our relationships with each other, including uh, to, re to revise and change how it is that we practice a lot of different institutions, one of them being, of course, marriage. Um, I, I think I, I, I don't, I can't, um, Candace's question, I don't wanna, I don't wanna mm, tease things out of it that, are, that, that may not be there, but, but I think that um, if we can liberate ourselves from the notion of the categorization of life, the suburban home landscape that I described earlier, one reason it's really useful to capitalism is the same reason that the books on your bookshelf are in um, are categorized um, because it's useful for the purposes of sales. It's useful for capitalism. And if we start rethinking capitalism in some way or another, like the French bookstore, where you go in the bookstore and the books are not categorized by, you know, science fiction here and medical books here and memoirs here and whatever um which gives me another you know sort of riff and then i'll turn it back over to you but it's really interesting to think about the rise of memoir every bookstore that you go into when we are able to go into bookstores again has now a whole wall of memoirs when i published geography of the heart in 1996 they didn't know where to put it because there was no category for memoirs and the reason there was no category for memoirs was because memoirs were written by women about um, interior lives. And that wasn't anything that the dominant male culture was interested in. The interior life was not something that was important. Um, and the beginning, I think, with the AIDS memoirs and also um, memoirs by women like my recently deceased um, Portland friend, uh, Shirley Abbott, um, they pushed memoir to the front, to the forefront. And I think there's a symbiosis there going on between what Candace is referring to about the importance of an interior life and the necessity of that as an element of our cultural fabric um, coming to the forefront. And we see the rise of the memoir and the fact that you go in to a bookstore today and you see this wall of memoirs there's there's something going on there. Twenty years ago, you would not have seen that wall of memoirs. You would have had to search hard to find a memoir. So yeah. that rise of the first person voice, the heresy of self love, which I write a lot about, I think that has a lot to do with a healthier society. Yes, I th I think that's so true. Um, okay, let's see. I think there's perhaps one more question. Um, oh, this is a good one. Uh, how do you embrace solitude without descending into depression? There's, <laughs> there's no name Ooh. here. I don't know to ask this. <laughs> These people are asking me the tough questions. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good one, though. It is an absolutely yeah. good one. And, you know, I think that the, the challenge is, um, Boy, I could give so many answers. I mean, for me, um, as I write about in the book, um, uh, uh, I, I, I go into the woods. I go to nature. I'm never lonely in nature. And that's another, here's another little interesting historical riff. Um, the word lonely was used to mean an exalted and, um, uh, ecstatic state. Um, you may have learned in grade school Wordsworth poem. I wandered lonely oh, yeah. as a lonely as a this beautiful floating thing in the sky. And then ten years later, the word is the first use of use. Eighteen sixteen is the first use of the word loneliness to mean um, bereft for want of companionship. And that's about the rise of the Industrial Revolution and the depersonalization of our society. Figuring out, to get back to that excellent, hard question, <clears throat> especially in our society, which I, you know, you can see I'm not a big fan of capitalism, <laughs> wants us to be depressed because then we go out and buy things. And then we go out and, you know, we take drugs to address our depression and whatever some way of, I say it has to be engaging the body because the 
the body is the seat of not the mind. The mind is not separate from the body. Um, the body is the seat of wisdom, is something that Western culture is still not comfortable with. So it can be cooking, it can be playing the banjo, it can be learning to play the banjo, it can be going out in the woods for a hike, it can be taking a bike ride, it can be whatever it is, but something that first of all involves body, and secondly, that really lets go of the notion that if you're not being useful, you're not being, you're not a part of our society, that you have to be producing something, whatever it might happen to be, um, in order to in order to have a legitimate role in our society. And whatever you can do to get yourself away from that is uh, is helpful. And I guess finally, the root of uh, the, the, the foundation of my question uh, or my response would be figuring out to do something with the body that um, it can be simple and low key. They should be simple and low key. But something that gets us out of here and into the physical lived world. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does make sense. Um, it's also interesting, though, that I, I feel like my own loneliness, maybe as a child or, or my own times of being depressed, writing actually is what has helped me, which is not really getting out. And but it is the kind of writing that's not uh, it's not to produce for some reason. It's just to express. Yeah. Um, and that, that's definitely been a big thing for me. Yeah, I I, um, I saved myself through writing. Uh, yeah. I, I, that's not an exaggeration. And reading and writing, the two are, of course, yeah, integrally intertwined. And the thing is, Wendell Berry has offered this observation to me, actually has it, I think, in a poem or an essay somewhere where he says, you know, I really dread the work. I, dr I get up in the morning and I dread it. I dread it. I dread it. And I'll make up any number of excuses not to do it. And then I get my pen on the page and everything is fine. Uh -huh. And you have to, you learn to recognize those demons. I think that's a great word for them. That the, the demons, they don't want you to heal yourself. They mm -hmm. want to distract you from whatever it is you're trying to do. And you, one learns to to recognize them and to um, ignore them, or even you know get friendly with them. I, yeah. I know them. Hello. Oh, you're right. back again. <laughs> Good to see you. Just go and sit in the corner with your nose to the wall. You know. Yeah. I'm not going to pay any. I'm going to you know. And also being able, being able, being able, being able to accept that success and failure, that awful binary. Is not what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You can write pages and pages of real crap. You will write pages of real crap and throw them away. And there's something, this is why I like to write by hand. There's something so satisfying about physically throwing it away. That is, you know, making the decision, you know, it's not any good, toss it, put it in the basket. Yeah. Uh, and again, Writing by hand, which of course everybody cannot do for lots and lots of reasons, but for me, the physicality, the incarnate, carnality, the Catholics would say, of the physical gesture of writing really is the body. It's, you know, it involves the body. And that's, right, right. I think that's why I write by hand at in the first draft. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Okay, uh, one one last question. I think we're probably closing in on an hour here. Uh, it's the issue, and the question of where one lives when one is writing, and whether that environment influences what you write, or if it's that strong bond that, for example, both of us have with our home states, even though we haven't lived in them for a long time. Um, what is it? Is Kentucky always in your writing, regardless of where you are? And is that a, a source of uh, creativity for you, the, the bonds and the memories of, of living there? Lord, it sure seems to be the case. <laughs> I mean, I know I you wish, I mean, that. I've written, as you know, a lot about San Francisco and France and, you know, and all that right. sort of thing. 
Um, it is a special place because of its intimacy and its smallness, and also because um, it has a dark undercurrent because of one of the principal reasons being uh, it was a slave state. And I feel like all the slave states have have some dark um, um, uh, um, sin. I don't know any better word for it that obviously we're still working out as a country. We have not, the, the myth, the, the binary myth is that the Civil War solved the problem uh, when it just booted the problem forward. Um, uh, but for me, place is very important. I think place is important for every writer, but it's important in different ways. I know writers who write wonderfully about urban landscapes. I know writers who write about, you know, Borges writes about a place that's in his head, you know, and makes up places. Uh, Italo Calvino makes up places. Um, but, you know, Toni Morrison puts Beloved in Northern Kentucky for a reason, because it's right there where the free states and the slave states are interacting with each other in a very dark and terrible way. Um, so um, I think finding that place, even if you yourself say, oh, I was a child of a military family, we moved all over the place, I don't have a particular place. I think you do have a place, but it's not necessarily the kind of place perhaps that Diane, you and I have. But there is a place. It can be speculative fiction. It can be another place. And, and your challenge as a writer, your challenge and your revelation as a writer and as a reader, you don't have to be a writer. You can see it just in the pattern of your reading. Um, is um, uh, It helps you figure out what that, to define that place and to um, sort of limit it as part of, it's where your imagination lives, which so nice takes us back to the beginning and 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 Frank O'Hara's command to us to imagine, you know, well, imagine your place. If you if it isn't if you're not lucky enough to have it just hand it to you on a platter with all of its darkness and craziness and oppression and Mitch McConnell, what can I say? <laughs> if you're is that lucky? I don't know. Um, but 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 imagine a place, you know, and look at your reading patterns, look at your life and say, what is my place? Where is my place? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I had never thought about one's reading patterns uh, applying to place, but it's very true. I mean, I immediately can see that in myself in my own reading. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there might be another question. Well, um, it's uh, three, three ten and, or four ten here, and uh, I think the Seattle Town Hall might, staff might, might want to, you know, go home and and party till dawn in whatever way they want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're home. <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. Well, right. Come on down to sunny Arizona. <laughs> oh, I would love that actually. Wouldn't you know? <laughs> yeah, but invite me back to Seattle in July. You know? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. It is definitely beautiful here in the summer. Um, well, I want to thank you both so much. This has been um, for for me as a as an introvert and as a spiritual person and also as someone who loves Wendell Berries. Thank you for so so much for uh, when you both said you were from Kentucky. I immediately thought of him. Um, yeah. Very enjoyable talk and very insightful, especially um, that last note about place. Um, I really appreciated hearing that. Um, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for watching um, as well on this Sunday afternoon. Um, I hope that you will purchase a copy of Fenton's book through the link on your on your live screen, uh, your live stream page. Um, it's going to take you right over to Elliott Bay, so you can purchase directly from from them. Um, if you want to follow this Crowdcast channel, you can do that and see what's coming up um, with us uh, by clicking the follow button in the top right corner. Um, you can also check out the calendar online. So um, thank you both Fenton and Diane. Thank you both so much again for this talk. Um, and I hope that you um, have wonderful Sundays, uh, very peaceful weeks ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. It was worth the wait, Candace. Oh, good. <laughs>